Okay, we are live and welcome to another episode of Gearbox 2.0. It is Wednesday, May 15th, 2015. And I just realized <laughs> that my camera might be set to something like auto ISO. So we'll see how that all goes. Hopefully the light won't change too much. It's a little bit cloudy today in Oregon. Big surprise. I'm just drinking water after my two espressos this morning. And I am excited to be back in the chair. Uh, anybody who's watching who is on the chat, could you please tell me if you can see and hear me just fine? This will be a little bit of a different uh, episode overall. So just let me know if you can hear me, if the audio is clear, um, if anything needs to change. And I make no promises because this may be the way we're set up. I have realized that one of the things that I need to, hey, FlexcoTube, uh, do is actually get a 23 millimeter fast lens for my X-T3 or maybe even wider so I can bring that camera in a little bit closer. I'm happy with the 35 in terms of depth of field and all that kind of stuff. Rimrock, I'm glad you can see me. Uh, link above in the chat, Today's episode, we're doing some housekeeping right now of camera and flask back in the saddle with myself, Caleb Pike and Ben Barton. And uh, we hope Ben makes it home. He'll have stories to tell, I am sure. But this week's episode of camera and flask tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern is a pretty exciting one. We are doing the 6K two camera, two carry on bag camera challenge. Hopefully I said that correctly. And basically it is you're getting on an airplane and you have uh, a roller that goes in your overhead bin. You have a backpack that goes in the seat underneath you. You do have one check bag, which has some grip, but really just five nano stands and everything else is your clothing. And uh, we have to come up with an entire two camera kit with lighting, with audio, with tripods, um, locked off shots. And we have to do it all under $6,000 US and hopefully get some pretty good kit in the process. So I know that myself and Caleb have been working diligently, suffering uh, to put our list together. Mine is now completely locked in. I don't know where uh, Ben is sitting in terms of all of this. And Bill, thank you very much for the welcome back. Afternoon, Sam. So here's the deal uh, before we jump into proposals and budgets and that kind of stuff. Last week was a little bit of a cluster. Uh, I was on the road for almost two weeks straight, San Francisco and New York. And then when I landed in New York, we had already made the decision not to do Cameron Flask, but we uh, we meaning me, that's kind of strange, had uh, every intention in the world of doing a Gearbox episode. And then I landed in New Jersey uh, for my job in New York. And I'm pretty sure, not 100% sure, that I got a tree pollen allergy because that happens to me sometimes at that time of year. And so if I sound a little stuffy, um, this part of my body basically shut down. And I still had to teach for three days, about 60 people over those three day period of time. Uh, I got through it, but there was no way in, uh, no way in heck that I was going to be doing a gearbox, uh, unless it was something that had already been shot. So it was basically back to the hotel, get some sleep, wake up, you know, rinse, repeat, all that kind of stuff. So I hope everybody's doing well. We've got some people here. Uh, this of course will be recorded and available for people to watch. Again, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about Cameron Flask and things like that. I want to jump into today's subject. As always, if you're watching the live stream, I have the chat right here. Please um, post questions, have some dialogue. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Tell people about it. Can I tell any juicy detail? Well, it's not really juicy detail about the job I had, Bill. Uh, basically, the job in San Francisco was for an existing technology client. Uh, they have a lot of cloud-based services and we were doing a three camera uh, production in a small soundstage in Emeryville slash Oakland, really right on the border there at a place called Athena Studio. 
and uh, it's a green screen shoot for a webcast slash webinar and everything was isolated recording but i had uh jeremy wyden who's based out of there basically DITing. and what we did is we uh, took those three cameras and fed them into a black magic atem and then we had a big honkin ass uh, monitor so that we could do live keys for the client so they could get a sense of what it would look like on their virtual set uh, and then we just did isolated recordings of that green screen. We did some Camtasia recording, uh, some stuff that had to be done there. We were all set up to do, um, an ethernet connected recording of their whole system and how you use it for some of their new features. But then in the end, they weren't ready for that. So we had to do some Hollywooding and we're doing that in post. I'm ignoring you messenger. But that, oh, I'm not. So Ben Barden, by the way, uh, if you know who he is from Cameron Flask, is uh, back in his country of the Czech Republic. And so he's heading home now. So he's going to be knackered when we get to Cameron Flask. Travis, nice to have you. Uh, job in New York was basically training for NBC Universal. Uh, we have a pretty cool space in New York that we've been using for NAB New York and then I use for this training called Baza Studio. It's right in Koreatown, funky little joint, uh, a lot of patina, a lot of character to it, but we are going to be using that space, I believe, for my workshops in New York in October in and around NAB New York again. So if you're in that area and you're looking for production-based workshops, then maybe that's uh, something you'd be interested in doing. We'll do one day that's dedicated to lighting and one day that's dedicated to corporate and in-house production. And I've made some changes even recently to how that workshop or those workshops are um, going to run because they are uh, I, I, they were getting a little too gear heavy and I have pulled that back and I really just want to focus on basics. That doesn't mean simple. It just means not having so much gear and GAC to, to do all the stuff that we're doing. Um, I'm also thinking about Gearbox a lot and <clears throat> starting to formulate some ideas behind how I really want my weekly show to be. Uh, I want the format to be a little bit different than I've been doing. I think maybe my strength is in teaching how to do things. And I'm trying to figure out how to do that in basically real time, but within a 10 to 15 minute, minute, minute period of time so that um, I think about and I can focus on one particular area, one particular thing and show that to people. Uh, hopefully answer some questions though. That's the tricky part when you're doing that. And that's all part of the stuff that I'm trying to sort out. So wheels are turning. Uh, I've got a lot to think about there. And Bill, I don't know where you're based uh, in terms of being an assistant. Okay, good. So just keep posting questions, keep asking questions, and we're going to jump into it. Um, excuse me. This is not the first time I'm going to talk about Budgets and propose what? Sorry, rewind, reset, press play. This is the first time that I'm really going to start to speak about writing budgets and proposals on Gearbox. I doubt that it's going to be the last time. Um, so, hey, thanks, Gerald. Okay, so let's get into this. We all, in some form or another, have to deal with the business side of what we're doing. Um, <laughs> Bill is in Greece, so I guess that's not going to work unless I come and teach a workshop in Greece. But we are kind of, well, most of us are creatives. And so what we're trying to do is we are trying to focus on how we take what a company is doing. We want to understand what their product or service is. We want to understand what they're trying to accomplish from a marketing and branding perspective. And then we are brought in in a, 
a finite role, it should be a finite role, to produce a, a, a product for them that is going to support their branding and or marketing efforts. So that comes into the business side. And then what we have to do is we have to do a project breakdown. We have to figure out a way to, um, we have to figure out a way to create a blueprint for ourselves and for the client so that ultimately we have a, a very clear idea, or at least for me, this is the way I approach it, a very clear idea of what it is that I am producing in terms of the product. I also don't like gray. So I'm very much a black and white type of person when it comes to putting everything in writing, making sure that everything is clear and concise, uh, going back and forth and not compromising with a client or potential client in terms of just, well, <clears throat> For me, money is always the byproduct. So when I'm doing this, of course, I want to be busy. Of course, I want to take work all of the time. But I have found that when I make money, the primary goal of doing a job, then at least in terms of what I do for a living, it doesn't work. Uh, if money is the byproduct and I say I'm going to write a proposal creatively, I'm going to put together a project and all of the things and problem solving and everything else, and I'm going to put a dollar amount to that, but that's not the driving force behind getting the work. If it's the byproduct, it always works out better, at least for me personally, uh, when I'm doing work for clients. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to initially, when I am first approached or I am speaking to a company about services, determine if there are any red flags. Because if, first of all, I, I'll say this, um, in, a, in a bidding process, you are sometimes asked to provide a proposal uh, to a client, sometimes an existing client, and you're doing it because there's a requirement to get at least three bids. Um, and you have to understand that if it's an existing client, I think you have the right to say, um, you know, is this, uh, you know, part of a, a broader bid or is this something that, um, you know, is something that is pretty much a definite. And you have to be careful of how you word that and how comfortable you are with your client. Some of the clients that I have, I can do that with and some of them I cannot. If it's a brand new client or potential client, then one of the things that you have to, I think, do is kind of figure out whether or not this is a serious project or not. Um, one of the first signs that it might not be or that you could get yourself in trouble further down the line is if you have a potential client and they say, you know, we'd like you to create a or we need you to create a 10 minute video, five minute video. And we want to get an idea of what the price is. And as you start to talk to that potential client, you start to try to clarify what the parameters are of the project, you get a lot of brush off. And it's, well, we just need to know how much it's going to cost to create a five-minute video. And you're talking about, okay, so where are our locations? Uh, how many people are involved in the video? And if they keep brushing you off, then generally you're either just part of a, an overall you know, three-bid process or it's going to get ugly in the future because I have found historically anytime I'm dealing with an individual or people at a company that are not giving me enough information about what their company represents, what their brand is about, uh, what, what their, uh, who their target audience is or who they want it to be, then I am being brought on as uh, a person who's being asked, maybe not directly, to be the potential solution to them not knowing enough about what it is that they're trying to accomplish, uh, or I become an unusual solution to their problem. And that's never going to go well in the long term. So if you have a, a marketing director or somebody in the company who is not giving you enough information where you can ingest that information, you can process it. And then if anybody asked you what it was that that company did, you would 
if you were not able to explain it to somebody else in layman's, in simple terms, then that's a humongous red flag for me. Um, so it, it's the two-parter. It's just give us a price with no real data. And it's also, well, we want you to figure that out in terms of what the message is and things like that. Those two things are huge red flags for me. They say that that company doesn't really have a clear idea of what it is that they're trying to do. Now, I'm not saying that we're not supposed to be creative people, but we need a certain amount of information. We need a certain amount of data as people who are going to produce a project in order to put something together that's going to become the blueprint of the structure for what you're going to be doing for your production. Uh, we're not a long-term solution. If we're the long-term solution, then we should be in-house being the marketing experts for that company. We're just trying to understand who their potential audience is supposed to be, what their message is supposed to be, and then creatively come up with concepts and pitch those to the client in our proposal. That would be the way that we are going to approach that. And sometimes creatively is not more than, okay, we're going to pick great locations and we're going to have a message and we are going to have a certain number of people who are going to be involved in this. And then, of course, a lot of that's going to have to do with the aesthetic and the look and feel of what you produce. Again, feel free to comment, ask questions and do stuff like that. So uh, <clears throat> you get those two red flags out of the way. They are not trying to um, make you the solution to what they're trying to do as uh, the marketing department or people in the company. They are not trying to make you the brand expert for their company. And they are also providing you with enough information where there's a dialogue that you can create a, a comprehensive blueprint proposal and the budget for the production. Uh, you also want to determine pretty early on who the decision makers are, if you can. One of the reasons that I got out of uh, one of the reasons that I got out of pharmaceutical work a long, long, long time ago, and we're talking over 20 years ago, is because very oftentimes you would do work for a pharmaceutical company creatively all the way to the end part of the project. It would be, again, through all of your rounds of revisions, approved. And then, as I say, there's like a little tiny Alice in Wonderland door that opens. And now you find out that there's a whole other group of people that need to review this that you were not made aware of earlier on, even if you asked. Um, once they review the project, very oftentimes, they would say, we want to make changes. Sometimes those changes would be huge changes. And here's the kicker. They didn't care that they had to pay a lot of money to make the changes. But if you've ever had that happen to you once or multiple times, it is absolutely deflating to you creatively because you have thought that you have gone through this process and you are now at the end of the process. And sometimes you're going back to almost the beginning. And that's no bueno for somebody like me. I can't work like that. So I don't know what to do. Um, Requests for proposals are also kind of big red flags for me. I think that if you're going to go down that route where you have a company organization that uh, distributes a request for proposal, they are absolutely looking for multiple proposals and budgets from different companies. And it really takes skill to break those down in a certain way. Um, it's, it's really, really crazy. Um, Steve says the creative approach section of my proposals probably actually gives away far too much to be honest, but I use it to show my creative abilities and understanding of marketing. Often my approach works because I end up competing with more other uh, boilerplate proposals, not, but not always. Yeah, that's true, Steve. So I, I do want to clarify if it's unclear that I'm not saying that your proposal shouldn't be creative. I'm saying that you don't want to get yourself in a situation with a company or organization that is, assuming that you're going to solve their problems as opposed to creating something for them that supports their branding and or marketing message. So those are two different things. It's looking for the red flags more than anything else. I probably give away too much in my proposals as well, but I consider my proposals and my budget as absolute uh, to, to the degree that I can do it blueprints for what I'm going to be doing for that production. Uh, and, and then once we start, 
it's all about problem solving for the normal crap that we have to deal with. So, um, okay, so you get requests for proposals. Those are big honking ass documents and they ask you to break down a million things. You kind of have to have somebody in your organization, your company that focuses on those exclusively if you're gonna go down that route. Um, the other thing that you might have to deal with, which I've been dealing with more and more over the years, are something called SOWs, which are statements of work. So what you'll do is you will create a proposal or a budget, uh, both together in one document uh, sometimes. That's the way I do it. And then when you submit it to the company, their legal department takes that and puts it into a format along with their legalese and their stuff uh and they create essentially what the actual agreement will be between you and the company now the thing about statements of work is they are very much favoring the company that you are doing the work for so they are taking essentially a boilerplate legal document that has to do with what is theirs what is yours um, what you're responsible for what to a certain degree they're responsible for but generally always to protect them as a company. And they are incorporating some uh, or ideally all of your proposal and your budget. Uh, one of the things I can say about statements of work is not every company works the same when it comes to statements of work. And some companies are very happy to just take your proposal in its entirety with your budget in its entirety and put that into different sections of their SOW or statement of work along with their legalese. And then that becomes the legal binding document between the two. Um, and then I'll answer that question in a second, Bill. Uh, and then basically you have to decide how much you want to fight for getting your entire proposal and budget into that SOW. There may be parts of your proposal, uh, terms and things like that, which are already kind of or completely covered by their legalese and what they're saying. So you have to get the big stuff in there. And the big stuff is scope of work, what it is that you are creating, number of revisions, and of course, the uh, billing schedule and the components having to do with that. Bill says, what happens if the client decides he won't hire you eventually and you have spent a lot of hours preparing the presentation? Well, Bill, that happens, unfortunately, all of the time. But my viewpoint is I try to vet potential clients a little bit, weed them out as much as I can to figure out if those red flags exist. Because I am trying to determine, am I going to spend the next day or day and a half of my life figuring out what that production is going to be, what that project's going to be. Uh, and I know that there's going to be a percentage of those, even sometimes with existing clients, uh, even sometimes with existing clients who say, no, 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 we're having you bid on this because we think you're going to do the production, that sometimes that's not going to happen. So that is a reality of what we do. Uh, but I have found that any time that I have been less than uh, thorough with the process of creating a proposal or a budget, it's come to bite me in the ass later on. So I'm willing to do that, to have that blueprint. I'm willing to do that knowing that a percentage of the jobs aren't going to come through. But part of it is, again, that red flag thing. Sometimes what I will do is I will actually, I have a little spreadsheet which is usually incorporated into my proposal, which I'll show you guys in a few minutes. Um, and I'll just bang out what I think the project's going to cost in terms of pre-production, production, post-production, post -production, equipment, uh, all of the elements that have to do with, you know, what the cost of the, the project are going to be. And that could include, if it's not a local production, what I think hotels and travel and everything else are going to cost. And I will create a... Uh, a budget sheet, which is part of what I do always anyway. And then I will throw out a ballpark range to the client. I don't make a habit of doing that, but if I am not sure if they're really serious and I'm just trying to sort that out, then sometimes throwing numbers out to them before you sit down and actually break down and write an entire proposal is a smart way to go. That is something that comes into play with what I almost always remember to tell people, which I'm going to remember right now, which is trust 
your instincts. So again, trust your instincts. If there's that little feeling there that there's something not right, then I found that pretty good chance something's not right. And the goal here for you is that you're when uh, when you're working for a company. What's up, Sky? Um, when you're working for a company, it's supposed to be open communication. This is a creative endeavor. So if it's closed doors and you're not getting information and that is preventing you from doing what you need to do to provide the client with what their expected end product is, then it's all going down uh, pretty badly anyway. So it's another way to not go down the route, uh, road of spending all of that time on the proposal and um, just give them a ballpark number. Don't make a habit of that. Feel it out. Trust your instincts. If you're hearing this, that's from last week. Sinuses, East Coast, back in Oregon, clearing up. Sinus stuff in play, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's take a look at the proposal. Start to break it down. See what's happening. Keep your questions coming. It's a little quiet on here, but I'm okay with that. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's see if I can do this properly. I'm going to have to do this later on for Cameron Flask. By the way, if you are just showing up at the top of the chat, there is a link. Uh, David, glad you made it. Uh, there's a link at the top to this week's Cameron Flask. It's going to be pretty awesome. Do I have any templates that you can share with us? Not at the moment, Michael. I'm going to think about that a little bit as I go forward. Um, when I do paid workshops and stuff like that, I do have some stuff that I provide. Um, I'm open to the idea. Let me start to sort all this stuff out, but take some notes and we'll go from there. Um, it's all coming from you anyway. Okay, screen share. Let's see what happens. Application window. Looks like I have something here. I'm going to choose this one. I'm going to share it. And I'm going to present to everyone. And you guys are going to tell me whether or not you can see this on uh, your screen. So that's what I'm going to need to do first. Bingo. Did we switch over to this proposal, this mock proposal? Anybody? Everybody? Uh, Michael? Sorry, listening while editing. How much do you budget for contingency? That depends, Travis. Uh, Gerald sees it. Steve sees it. Okay, we're in. Okay. So this is a mock proposal, but it is based on actual work that I have done in the past. Um, I think that it's a, a good example of something that um, represents what I would say would be a pretty typical proposal for um, I'm making that a little bit bigger for you guys. And let me make sure I can still see the chat. I'm an idiot over here. Come on, kid. Uh, everybody see that? So I think it represents a pretty good um, overall, what we would say, corporate slash uh, documentary style production. So let me just kind of go through this. I'm not going to read the whole thing. We only have another 20, 30 minutes, but I do want to kind of give you an idea of my process. So... So here we go. So the following proposal, so I always have an introduction, is for the pre-production, production, and post-production of a five to seven minute video that will be shown at a particular event on a particular day. Once produced, the video will also be shown and distributed through other outlets. So you are acknowledging where else this might be distributed to. Um, goal here is to, in a very small little snapshot, uh, one graph paragraph, to say kind of what the overall thing is. So you're specifying length of video, uh, where it's gonna be, and then also distribution. Um, so uh, Joshua, you're asking a question. I don't know when you came in. I think that I, um, I'm not a bullet list kind of person in terms of the first three things you need to know before you can start with uh, writing a proposal. I think that the first thing is that you have to figure out whether or not this is a serious potential client. Um, I talked about some red flags a little bit earlier on in the live stream. Um, you also have to, you know, 
like gather all your data. When I am starting to write my proposal, I'm in the process of starting to hold crew. I'm in the process of figuring out how much it's going to cost for travel and expenses and accommodations and everything else. Um, you know, part of this comes from experience uh, after doing it many, many, many times. I've been writing proposals since, uh, I don't know, too long. Am I allowed to say? 24, 25 years. So it's been a while. Um, so there you go. Okay. So after you write your introduction, you give a project overview. Now, this is going to be totally different depending on what type of project you are creating for the client. And what I mean by that is if you're doing a, you know, a, a, a standard interview-based production, it's going to be very different than if you're doing a TED Talk style production, uh, which will be multi-camera and you might have a live switcher and comm systems and other things that are needed in that type of production. It might be different than the production I just did in San Francisco, which is a three camera green screen shoot. All of these in terms of the overview of what you are doing is going to be different based on the type of production. But the purpose of the project overview for me is for me to take all of that information that I've been gathering from my client or potential client and put that into writing so that we both sides know that we're on the same page in terms of my understanding of what it is that we're trying to accomplish and also to lay the groundwork for that blueprint for what it is that we're going to be doing for them. So this is um, a proposal for an annual fundraising event for this client. And it's for a, a, a school, a higher education, a university. And basically they had this annual event, not called this because this is a mock proposal, um, which provides the organization to sustain fundraising momentum with their established owners, with board members, alumni. So we're naming and, and acknowledging who the people are going to be at this event. And then also it will introduce um, the whole campaign of fundraising to new attendees. So that's important. In a very short three lines, I'm stating who target audience is based on what I understand from the client. I'm also saying that, oh, this target audience may actually include new people. Um, they had a centennial celebration and they basically were opening up a new building in a certain month. And this event would be basically ideal for, you know, for the organization to talk about that and also their future. So with the new building, which they had completed, they're basically providing, and now we start to name <clears throat> the people that are going to occupy and be a part of this building, educators, students, and scientists with an innovative environment of higher learning and research and development. This environment will help produce the next generation of scientists and support further discoveries to eradicate disease worldwide. I made that up. That's just part of the mock proposal. I wish that's what they were doing. Maybe they were doing that to a certain degree. Um, the new building is just a space, though. It's the educators, students, and scientists, and what they do with it that will write the next chapter in the organization's history. So to introduce this next chapter, this video will focus on the people that will occupy the building. We will interview a diverse group of up to eight uh, educators, students, and scientists, and hear in their own words what the vision building and uh, the organization means to them. This will include their thoughts about occupying and using the new building, the scholarship program, goals for the future. These interviews will illustrate the exceptionally high caliber of educators, students, and scientists that are part of this organization. Now, the point here is that I'm starting to, in my project overview, actually create uh, a blueprint for how many people are actually going to be involved in this project from a talent standpoint, who that talent will be, and then also um, what some of the questioning might be, what are some of the conversations that are being uh, going on as part of the messaging here. And again, this is all part of that going back and forth with the client and understanding who they are. <clears throat> um, this is the contract, by the way, Sky. This is my proposal in full. It includes the budget and there is actually project terms in here. So this is my process for creating a contract with a client. Sometimes, Sky, this will become a statement of work and get incorporated into that. But this is my document that I have with them. Uh, it's comprehensive. 
but it's the blueprint. And then when I start a project, I know exactly what we're doing. And then I can deal with the problems that come up uh, as opposed to trying to figure out what the actual project's going to be. Okay, so as with the past two videos, because we had done other work for this client, we also plan to have an uh, interweaving narration by essentially the president of the school and possibly one other key alumni. So, uh, or faculty member. So basically we suggest these interviews focus on the students and scientists occupying the building, more having to do with what we're kind of talking to them about. But at the moment, at this point, I have basically said that there are going to be 10 people potentially that are going to be interviewed and will be a part of this production in terms of talent. So I'm starting to put that into writing, not just throw it into a budget or something like that. Um, then we get into messaging while the new video will have an underlying message asking to support uh, the campaign. It will not be the main focus. They wanted to do a very soft sell for this particular production. So we envision the video will tip its hat, acknowledge the past hundred years of the school, and then the organization's continued commitment to the founder's mission. But it will primarily focus on forward thinking and change and the future and all of that crap. And I mean that in the best way. Uh, areas that may be addressed in the video, if appropriate, and again, this has to do with the questions you're going to ask, the things that you're going to be having conversations with people about, are the unique shared spaces uh, for the new building that had been built, uh, information on the research foundation to eradicate you know, worldwide disease. Um, also important that there's a clear underlying message that support is still needed. They still need money and they need big checks, lots of drunk people eating good food, hopefully a good caterer and uh, open bar. And uh, let's write a, a you know, a hundred thousand or $500,000 check to this, uh, you know, school. Uh, discussing future plans for the campus, historical buildings, blah, 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 blah. But you get the basic idea. So if you were doing this for a, uh, a, a TED Talks type of thing, and I've done a lot of those, then this pre-production, uh, I mean, um, uh, project overview area would be very different. You would be breaking down uh, more about the actual production aspects and also responsibility between you and the client. Because if you're using a space, let's say a theater or something like that, you need to know what the client's responsible for, what you're responsible for. And again, the idea that we don't want gray, we want black and white. Okay, so then the next section we go into is pre-production. And this is basically where I'm saying, here's our, our now we're starting our creative process. Now we're into, you know, into the, the process of actually putting this thing together. So for this particular project, maybe pre-production will be spent finding talent. So that's gonna take time. Scouting locations, that's gonna take time. Preparing storyboards, we don't do that very often, but now with things like Cine Tracer, we can do some pretty cool stuff if we need to. Outlining, uh, outlining interview content, again, project overview above, gives you some ideas of the things that we're gonna be doing to create some maybe uh, interview questions. And, um, it's recommended, especially if you know that there's a timeline involved in this, always give yourself a deadline, always give yourself timelines, by the way. If you don't have timelines, projects will last forever. It is recommended that this phase of the project begin as soon as possible as starting the project in September when the building will be occupied would not give much time to complete the project. Prior to the event that's in November, we got to shoot the whole thing. We got to do all post production, blah, 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 blah. Um, we would like to find potential educators, students, and scientists before the summer to scout the building as soon as possible. Um, there are some neat, unique production opportunities that exist in the new building as in terms of look and feel. I always like to think about production design whenever I am putting a project together. Uh, we don't usually have production designers, but we want to think about that component to increase the quality of the product that we're creating. And then as occupation of the building will not take place until the end of August, we have the potential to shoot uh, exteriors and interiors of the building and also conduct all of the majority of the interviews in the building before September. By the way, uh, shit happens and that's not the way it worked out. We actually had to do most of our production once it was occupied because of safety reasons and we couldn't get into the building until a certain period of time because of that. Uh, we had a whole bunch of other things like, you know, always having a little money in your pocket to ask a uh, construction crew or somebody to come back later because you need to get some interviews done. So maybe they have an extended lunchtime. It's a thing. Okay, so production. Um, 
this is an older proposal, but so you know you can you know you can you can get the idea. But to maximize the budget that has been established, we have allowed for a total of five days of production for the project. So don't just put this into the budget. Don't just put five days of production. Actually, explain some stuff. Um, this will allow us to make sure that we are able to capture the footage necessary to realize the video outlined above. To accomplish this, two of the days will be comprised of a standard crew, and three days will be comprised of a smaller mobile crew. The two full crew production days will be devoted to capturing interviews with students at the building or buildings of the university. The smaller crew days will be used for shooting exteriors and interiors of the new academic building. Don't get confused with National Association of Broadcasters. They used to call their new academic building NAB as well. The ribbon cutting ceremony and footage of students and faculty working in the building. We intend to shoot full HD video to create a cinematic look to the videos. You know that that's kind of BS. I mean, it isn't BS, but HD doesn't make it cinematic, but it's a proposal. I could get into, we're going to use large sensor, we're going to use this, but whatever. Uh, to further this, we will also use film lenses for the production. This is the production technique that was used for the prior vi videos. Uh, this will create a cinematic widescreen image ideal for event TV and computer-based playback. Okay, post-production. Uh, questions are welcome. You're allowed to ask questions. Post-production, we'll focus on editing the five to seven minute video. Editing will happen immediately after production has been completed. Put a date on that. The video will be brought to a rough cut stage. This is where we start to get into number of uh, rounds and revisions. So we brought to a rough cut stage and submitted for review and feedback. Based on feedback, a revised cut will be submitted for the video. Uh, if at that stage a minor changes need to be made, then will be implemented in the final version of the video will be submitted for final approval. So that's basically three rounds, right? Um, so here's the deal. You have to figure out who your particular client is. You have to figure out uh, how much hand-holding they need, how much post-production is going to be needed, how many rounds are going to be needed. You might have four rounds of revisions inside of your standard proposal, and you might just budget for that because one of the things that I hate doing is I hate surprise costs for my clients. So that's why I spend so much time doing this. So once the video has been approved, it will be prepared for final output, color corrected, titled, and mixed, and delivered so it can be uploaded and distributed to their intended audience. Now, I'm going to acknowledge something right now. I know that some of you people are screenshotting this crap, um, and I'm not going to distribute this <laughs> proposal as it is right now. I do ask that um, I'm just going to scroll up very quickly here that you understand this right here, which is it's a sample template. Um, the wording should be your own. It's to show you structure. It's to give you an idea of how I approach doing this stuff. It's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily for you to duplicate, and I would appreciate it if you don't in terms of verbiage and wording. It's to help you and guide you to help you be more successful at doing this. You will change things uh, based on who you are as a person and how you deal with your clients. So this is not an absolute in any shape way, shape, or form. Okay, so once the video has been approved, it will be prepared for final output, color corrected, titled, and missed. I know I said that already. And delivered so it can be uploaded and distributed to, uh, I will say, its intended audience. I'm going to fix that maybe. Uh, maybe. We'll see if I like that better. Who cares? Um, the estimated timeline for posts is four to five weeks. Sometimes I'm much more specific than that. Sometimes clients ask you to be more specific than that. From the start, date of editing, based on that schedule, final videos are targeted to be delivered by, again, deadline, deadline, deadline. Give yourself deadlines. Um, as in the past, part of the final delivery of the project will be for Zrew created to coordinate the playback of the video by the AV company that is handling the GHY vision event. I could go even further and put this, um, you know, provided, provided by the client for uh, ghy.org. That's a good example of putting something in there that is black and white, not gray, right? Good. Um, here we go. Budget estimate. Nitty gritty kids. Here we go. Got to put numbers on all this crap. Now, this is a more comprehensive budget sheet than I would normally provide, meaning I wish I had this size crew for most of the stuff that I do. Um, but it is breaking down 
pretty, um, I think pretty specifically what the main hats are that you would be looking for in a crew. And even if more than one of those hats is being worn by one person, it's acknowledging who those people are and what the jobs are that have to be done, right? So part of breaking down your um, budget is really about making sure that you are thinking about what all of those roles are and also acknowledging what rates are in your particular market. So one of the things that I like to do is, and this is pretty standard for me, when I break down pre-production on a um, production, I normally consider pre-production uh, an eight-hour day and then uh, I'm considering production in, well, now I'm in Portland. I'm not in Portland. I'm in Oregon. Jeez, man, I don't know what's going on over here, but everybody's on a 10 here with time and a half over that. Um, Richard, if you work alone, you just have to break this down in terms of, you know, your producer, director, DP, and then know that you're holding and uh, putting on all of those hats. So in New York, LA, we're 12 hours pretty standardly. Uh, so when I'm thinking production, I'm normally thinking that way. But you have to think of a producer and your market and where you're going and make sure that you know what the what the crew really thinks in terms of their days. Uh, it also might be what the role is of the crew. Some people might be, oh, I'm a 12, and then you'll get to the sound recorders and they'll be a 10 almost always with time and a half after that. So you have to plan accordingly in terms of your budget. But the other thing that I like to do is if I'm doing my pre-production um, and I figure out how many days I need for pre-production, I am going to, because I usually consider that an eight-hour day, even though eight hours is not half of 12 or eight hours is definitely not half of a 10, uh, I still feel that the type of work that I'm doing and what we're doing on those pre-production days is not as uh, stressful. It's not as, you know, in the trenches as production. So I usually put that in as a half rate of whatever the full day rate is going to be for the production side of it. So let's just say that I was coming in as a producer director and my day rate was going to be 750 then I would put 375 in here for my four days of pre-production, which would include a scout preparing everything. You know, again, you're not going to close every job, but you have to kind of factor in that you've put in this time as well when you're doing stuff. Director of photography, um, let's say that they're getting 600 a day. So you put them in at 300 for pre-production. That might be them creating a shot list, a lookbook. They might be going on a scout with you. Um, let's say it's a slightly better market, slightly different tier of client. Maybe um, you're making a thousand a day as a producer director, and the DP is making 750. So then you're putting them at 375 for um, for their day rate for pre-production, right? And then AC, we got to do a checkout day. So let's say they're making 600 for the day. So you give them 300. Let's say they're making 500 for the day. Then you give them 250. Again, I'm just giving you ideas here in terms of thinking this through. Uh, so we'll just say 300. Um, assistant director, not somebody you get to have very oftentimes this particular project. We were dealing with up to 10 people over a two-day period, lots of different uh, setups and locations. So I needed somebody to basically be on the scout and also be the one on set that was dealing with all of this talent and our moves and everything else in terms of company moves. Here's a big one. Guess what? We all need to eat. We all have expenses, right? If you're a producer director, put in a budget there so that there's some money for each of your crew for the number of days that you have right here so that you can actually cover those costs instead of them coming out of pocket. They are part of your budget for the client. Uh, okay, so production would be uh, basically double those numbers for our producer director. Um so we'll just put these in and I'm just kind of throwing in these things right now. I'm not going to fill in everything. Well, maybe I will. And we'll just go ahead and do this. And now we get into our second camera op. 
let's say, you know, we're getting them a nice rate. Let's say AC Camera Tech, we're giving them again. And you're going to see a little trend here, okay? We're going to see maybe I have my editor on set and they're the data wrangler. That can be huge, by the way, because if they're doing all of the ingesting and organization, post-production goes faster. Just a little tip. Sound recordist, let's say at best we're going to get them at 750 as an owner operator. More realistically, in a market with all of their equipment, they might be closer to $8,000 a day. We only need them for the two days that we're doing the interviews. Uh, let's say swing, we've got a grip electric here. Um, so we're going to maybe put them in. And it depends on who you have on your crew. Like, for instance, your data wrangler, maybe they're coming in at 400 for the day. Uh, or maybe they are at 600 a day, but let's just let's just say we have a, a, a decent budget here and uh, we can pay everybody decently. So one of the things that you'll see is that I, I try to keep like uh, roles at at the same uh, or very similar price points because otherwise it gets messy and that's a smart thing to do, uh, not to do it at different price points. Makeup artists, let's just say they're 750 for the day with their whole kit. PA, we've got somebody coming in. If you're not going to teach them things, then you have to pay them. So let's just say that we're coming in at PAs at 250. Uh, and then we actually basically have to say, you know, these are longer days here if they're going to be 12s. And there are always surprises like, you know, somebody has to take an Uber because the subway broke down or whatever it's going to be. So you have to have enough money in there for your crew meals and expenses and also not to penny pinch when you go back to the client and ask them for money because you're like, oh, uh, the second camera operator had to take an Uber or Lyft and blah, blah, blah. I don't ever speak to somebody like that, but I just felt like that's what I had to say. Uh, assistant editor. So how many days for assistant editing is it going to take? And you have to establish kind of what your rate's going to be there. Uh, by the way, when we're looking at these rates here in production and pre-production, these are transparent rates. So this is what I would be actually paying as a producer director to my actual crew. These are not rates that are then, you know, oh, uh, I'm going to I'm going to basically say I'm going to pay the DP 750 a day, but I'm only going to give you 500 and I'm going to keep 250. I'll show you where you're going to make profit on stuff <clears throat> that's coming up. Okay. So editor, let's just say that we have a, a really cool, amazing editor and they're getting 750. And then we've got post production supervisor. That's probably the producer director. You've got to put in a few days to manage all of that stuff. What that rate going to be? It might be 750. It might be 600. You just have to decide motion graphics. Are there any of that? Well, maybe there are. So maybe you have a couple of days in there at uh, $500 a day. And then you've got your finishing at the end to make sure everything is hunky-dory. Maybe it's just a day because it's only a five to seven minute video. Uh, and then you have to start to figure out what your uh, equipment costs are, right? So you got two cameras, you got lenses and everything else. Um, if it's your stuff, go to Adorama Rentals and figure out what the uh, rental rate is. Go to lensrentals.com. Try to figure out what the base is for a rental. And if you're keeping your kit in good shape, then that should work out pretty well. But let's just say that you're, you know, you're doing a three day week. So they're getting it for five days, but you're charging them for three, just like a rental house, uh, lighting, dolly and grip, whatever that's going to be. I'm just putting some numbers in here. Um, so sound guys getting paid, of course. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, David, if you're really good and you have a lot of equipment, as a sound recorder, I'm generally paying about seven fifty to a thousand a day. Um, Travis, thanks. See you guys at Cameron Flask later on uh, if you're jumping. But I uh, got another few minutes on this, and then we'll try to get through the at least the key parts of this. <clears throat> you got to charge your clients for storage. Um, that doesn't mean you're giving them project files, but you're going to have to buy hard drives. So figure out what they're going to cost. Let's just put some stuff in there. Okay, and then <clears throat> production insurance, that depends on what kind of production insurance you have. One of the tricks that you can do, it's not a trick, is you can go to productioninsurance.com. You can kind of get an idea of what short-term uh, production insurance is going to cost. I have an annual policy. You kind of have to break that down and say, what would it normally cost? And let's just say that it's 
uh, $550 for a short term for liability insurance, this and that. Might be a little bit more if you're talking about rental insurance. You have to figure it out. But if you have an annual policy, you've also got to make that money back, right? Uh, and then your production company fee. Now, that could be 15%. That could be 20%. That could be 25%, depending on what you're doing. From a number standpoint, what you want to do is you want to take this total number right here, sorry, uh, which is your total number. And what I do is I minus my producer director and my insurance fees from that. You have to decide if your post-production supervisor line item is a producer director thing. Um, but this is where you're basically making a profit as a company. So you take that let's just say 50,775. Uh, this is a five day production with a lot of crew and you minus, we go back up to pre-production $2,000 for the producer director in there. So you're not making a profit on your own rate. You're minusing $5,000 from the uh, production. If you're the post-production supervisor, again, you'll decide if that's something that you're gonna take out of there. Let's just do it for now. And then we also take out the amount for the production insurance as a hard cost. And we come up with $40,175. So $40,175. Uh, and there is your profit for the project. So that's how you're actually making some money and you're reinvesting into your company. Now, sure, you're a day player here as a producer director as well. So you're making... Uh, $7,000. If you're the post supervisor, you might make $10,000 on the production. Um, and, and if it's your own equipment, then you might be making money back on your equipment just to pay for it. Or you may be ahead of the game at that point. Um, yeah. There you go. Yes, Bill. Yeah, average salary per person really has to do with market. Um, I would say that most of these roles that we're looking at uh, when you're you're talking about this industry average between about four hundred and seven hundred and fifty dollars a day in corporate work, depending on the role and the market that you're in. I would say that's a good gauge. And then if you as a producer director can pay most of your crew, except for people like your DP, maybe a little bit more and, and things like that. Uh, somewhere between four to six hundred dollars a day. I think you're in about the right range. If you're in a more expensive market, then you might have to be in the five to six hundred uh, dollar price range. Uh, you cannot now be download this PDF right now. Uh, speak about that a little bit earlier in the live stream. I'm sure people are taking screenshots. Uh, please again read this disclaimer. This is just a guide. It's not to copy the words inside of here. It is basically just helping you as a guide to thinking about the process of uh, proposals and budgets. Okay, so we got a couple more minutes in here just to get over a couple more things uh, that I think are important to cover. Number one, you have to have your project terms. So this is where we get into the legal components of a proposal. Yes, I'm breaking down prior to that project overview, pre-production, production, post-production, post -production, how many rounds of revisions and, and all of that fun stuff. Uh, but then you have to put some stuff in there to protect yourself a little bit more. Uh, I always want my proposals to be fair, but basically you have to line item what is not included. So if you're not putting travel up here, into the production component of your proposal, then you need to um, say it does not include travel outside of a particular area. Uh, so above fees do not include travel outside of New York City. In that case, that's where I was based. Uh, talent or location fees, wardrobe, still photography, additional post-production beyond, of course, what's up in the proposal. Uh, stock imagery or music licensing fees. Now that may seem like a lot, but trust me, uh, those things can come up, and if you don't put them in your project terms, then there would be a gray area, and the client would say, well, I thought you were going to include music, or blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can absolutely put music in there. You just have to remember that it has to be part of this post-production section, and you can actually line item that. Maybe you have an annual membership to Artlist or something like that. So you can put in a certain amount of money that will be for, you know, non-original scored music. Be clear, black and white, not gray. Um, 
I sometimes will say, based on the proposal outlined above, if I know exactly what we're doing, they're not fees that we anticipate. Now, if crew and equipment need to relocate, I have some things about going, you know, overtime and things like that. It can be pretty intense sometimes the way I write this because I want to uh, make sure, well, let me talk about that in a minute. But basically, it has to do with termination fees. And then here's the part of me, the key to the castle. I'm a small company. Most of you probably have small companies unless you're working in-house. If you are trying to survive as a company, you need to make sure that you can cover your pre-production and production equipment costs. So I make that the billing upfront in almost all of my proposals. Now, there are exceptions to this, of course. You have a client and they say, we only want to pay in thirds or we only pay 50-50. Um, what you have to do is you have to put this into your proposal initially. There's nothing unreasonable about this. You're being, you know, transparent here and you're saying here are the costs for the things that I am providing. And you can say, you know, I've got a couple of other projects and I can't just float this entire project if that conversation comes up. But you have to cover your costs. Um, I want to pay crew quickly. I want to pay all of my production costs before I actually show up to the production. I also, um, you know, need to survive as a company. So basically, I don't charge for any post-production or my profit until the second invoice. But I do want to make sure that I'm covering the costs that are related to pre-production and production. And that's where this billing schedule comes in. Uh, for the proposal. So I'm going to stop sharing for a minute and then just talk about a producer's role a little bit more. Um, so, uh, and, and Tommy, this all scales down. Um, you really just have to take that budget and you, you reduce the number of days and the number of crew. I still spend just as much time breaking down pre-production, production, post-production, post and uh, the project overview. It's just how many days, how many people are involved in the pre-production, how many people are involved in the production. Um, you might be the assistant editor and the editor. Give each of those jobs a line item as a separate thing when you're doing it. The other thing as a producer director that I like to do is I like to pay people quickly. I also like to be fair to crew in the sense of always being in communication. When I'm soft holding people for a job, um, if they get challenged, they're supposed to call me and let me know that somebody's challenging those dates. And then I can go back to the client and say, I have crew on hold. Are we still okay for these dates? And we want to push the proposal through. Uh, sometimes that will work. Um, Ryan, I handle payment for my team members by uh, creating an independent contractor agreement for what the services are they are providing. Uh, that's essentially my contract with them because they are not an employee of the company. And then I pay them net 30. But honestly, in most situations, I'm getting paid for pre-production, production and equipment prior to the production actually happening, which means that I'm usually scheduling payment out within a week to two weeks after the production, sometimes the day or two afterwards if I can, depending on what my schedule is. So I like to pay people within a couple of weeks if I can. But my contract with them says net 30 because clients are unpredictable. Um, you got you to gotta push a little bit. You know, I know we want to make money. And I know that there's some times where we have to make concessions. But you have to uh, do your thing with checks or wiring funds. So, Ryan, I have online banking. So what I basically do is I just set up a bill pay system for all of my crew. And then I have them invoice in this country. They provide a, a W-9 as well. And then I set them up in there. And then I'm centrally paying everybody from the exact same place. Uh, in terms of doing that. They could technically be set up with wired funds. Then you get into ACH payments and they have to sign uh, paperwork for that. I generally just send them a check uh, right now. I know that's kind of archaic, but the United States, believe it or not, is very much still built on that system. Um, so yeah, so there you go. And then 
And then I just really try to make sure that I can release people uh, at least two weeks before production happens if I can. If I can't because a uh, client's sticking around and we're just trying to figure stuff out, then I'll just be in constant communication with that potential crew and see if they're still available and we make changes. I just had a job recently where we rescheduled the production three different times uh, and we even had to go in and change travel. So we had to resubmit the proposal a little bit to make sure that there was a little bit of funds for those uh, you know, travel changes and things like that. Okay, we're an hour and five minutes. Uh, I hope this episode was useful to everybody. I actually covered more ground than I thought I would in this particular episode. Uh, scroll back up to the top. Actually, I think I still have it in here. That is today's episode of Cameron Flask, which will be at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time, which is covering the 6K, meaning $6,000 US, two carry-on bag, two camera interview kit challenge. Uh, you guys should check it out. And there you go. Uh, thank you, Bill, very much. Uh, bah, 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 bah. So look, subscribe to the channel. Tell your peeps. I know I'm not as exciting as some of those other people, the youngins out there with their flashy transitions and everything. And I love that stuff. I watch it. I think it's great. Um, my job is to hopefully give you information that will help you do your job professionally in a more effective way. Um, and Michael, I'm just using Google Hangouts to stream and a little cam link 4K. Uh, hopefully you guys learned something along the way. Uh, and by guys, I mean guys and gals. And I hope you show up at Cameron Flash later on because I'm excited about this one. It was a heck of a challenge to figure out how to get all that stuff on as checked in uh, baggage. And I think enough of this. I'm ending off. Thank you for the kind words in the chat. And um, I don't know what to say. Thank you very much for the kind words. And hopefully I will see a bunch of you later on uh, on camera and flask with myself, Caleb Pike and Ben Barden, who will be uh, <laughs> a skeleton of himself after his travel or whatever we say. But hopefully he'll have a drink in hand and he'll be able to stay awake for a little while and uh, come by and check out the show. And thank you very much. Signing